Good morning, friends, and welcome to Wake Up in the Word. Thanks for joining me on a beautiful Monday morning. Grab a good cup of coffee and go with me over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We finished chapter 13 last week, the love chapter of the Bible, and I could really park there for a while as we define some of those characteristics of love and really open that up even more. But I think we've laid the foundation for what Paul was trying to do. He gave us chapter 13 through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit after dealing with the, the purpose and plan for spiritual gifts in chapter 12, talking about how the body is made up of so many different parts that work together and have a different set of gifts that's given. Everybody doesn't have all the gifts. Everybody doesn't have the same gifts, but they work together to make the body what it is. Then he deals with love and begins chapter 14 this way. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Now, before he begins explaining this, understand that the gift of prophecy is that which involves preaching the word of God, preaching God's message to the people so that they can understand it. The gift of prophecy is given, of course, in the language that the hearers can understand so that they can act upon what is said. Now, I'm reading this out of the 1984 NIV right now because I'm, I wanted to use this particular note that comes from Spiros Zodiates, where he explains a little bit about what's going on in chapter 14, gives us the historical connotation to go along with it. He writes, you know, in three historical incidences, speaking in tongues refers to the dialects or languages which were understood by others present on the occasion, but which had never been learned by the speakers. And that's the miracle that took place in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, again in Acts chapter 10, and then finally in Acts chapter 19, verse 6. These were the three incidences historically recorded in the book of Acts of people speaking in languages that they had not learned previously, glorifying God, and therefore demonstrating that the messages that are coming there, praising God and pointing to Jesus, are all being generated by the Holy Spirit through those people. Now, back to the note. He says, um, these cases clearly involved divine enablement. The usage of the singular form, glossa or tongue, in this passage, however, may refer to an ecstatic utterance, which no one understood. And that's made clear in the passages we'll get to later. The members of the church are to build each other up. That's what Paul has been trying to emphasize to this broken church at Corinth since he started the letter. Therefore, no one should speak in the presence of others unless the hearers can understand what's being said. And if you see that uh, some of these notes on some of these previous passages that we'll get to, you can see that that's an emphasis Paul has actually throughout this particular epistle. Speaking words, he goes on to say, which are understood by others is declared to be much preferred to uttering that which is not understood. Now let's put this in some historical context because what was going on there in the culture where the church at Corinth has been created. This brand new gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ has invaded the culture. What kind of culture? Well, when you read about what was going on there historically, we've got another uh, angle that'll help you understand why Paul had to deal with this issue at Corinth. One commentator puts it this way, in the church at Corinth, much of the tongue speaking had taken on the form and the flavor of pagan ecstatic utterances. Now, what are we talking about there? Well, as it was commented on back in chapter 12, the practice of ecstatic utterances was common. And it was common in many of the pagan Greco-Roman religions of Paul's day, including those active in Corinth. Now, here's what they would do. Devotees of some god would drink and dance themselves into frenzies until they went into semi-consciousness or even unconsciousness, an experience they considered to be the highest form of communion with the divine. They believed that in such drunkenness, their spirits left their bodies and communed directly with the god or gods, a practice to which Paul alludes even in Ephesians 5.18. 
The ecstatic speaking that often accompanied such experiences was thought to be the language of the gods. Are you getting the picture now? Yeah, many of the people who had been practicing these religions have now become Christians, and they're in the church. For many of them, it was trying to figure out how this might apply in this newfound faith of theirs. He goes on to say that in the church at Corinth, much of the tongue speaking had taken on this form of these uh, ecstatic utterances that the pagans had used. Emotionalism had all but neutralized their rational senses, and selfish exhibitionism was common, with everyone wanting to do and say his own thing at the same time. Services were bedlam and chaos, with little worship and little edification taking place. And because of the extreme carnality of the church at Corinth, we can be sure that much of the tongue speaking there was counterfeit. Believers were in no spiritual condition to properly use true spiritual gifts or properly manifest true spiritual fruit. Now he get, begins to go on and talk about what we know about the Corinthian church from what Paul has already said and will be seeing about their problems throughout this letter. He asked this question, how could a congregation so worldly, opinionated, selfish, uh, envious, jealous, divisive, argumentative, arrogant, disorderly, defrauding, inconsiderate, gluttonous, immoral, and desecrative of the Lord's Supper, exercise the gifts of the Spirit. <laughs> For them to have done so would have defied every biblical principle of spirituality. You cannot walk in the Spirit while exercising the flesh. And this is a principle that seems to be obvious to almost anyone, yet we still have this going on today. Where folks will say somehow uh, going into a wild trance and going completely bananas and rolling around in the floor is somehow some spiritual activity that God would have instituted himself. Now, listen, I love to see people worship in genuine experiences in which the Holy Spirit is moving you. But we've seen incidences in the past two, three decades even, where folks claimed that the Holy Spirit was instituting all kinds of activity, even passing out bags and saying, you know, we're going to have a service today in which everybody's going to get rid of the demons and, and already setting them up for the idea that somebody's going to start puking in the congregation. So all of you are going to be throwing up and this is cleansing the soul. You know, strange things happen in churches these days under the guise of spirituality, and it's no different than what was going on in the days of the first century Corinthian church. Because of that, Paul is trying to allow them a little bit of leeway while trying to point them in the right direction as to what they should be doing when it comes to exercising spiritual gifts. So he says, desire especially this gift of prophecy. In verse 2, for anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their encouragement, their strengthening and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. But he who prophesies edifies the church. Now, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I'd rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than one who speaks in tongues unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. Now, keep in mind, in this Mediterranean culture, it was quite a multilingual bag full of people who spoke multiple languages. Now, when I say this to a lot of my audience in the United States of America, it's very uncommon for us to see people who speak multiple languages. In fact, it's quite difficult sometimes to find people here who speak the English language the way it's supposed to be spoken. So as we understand this, they were used to people coming in to the church and to their community who perhaps spoke a foreign language. And it was common for that to take place. Even as we go into missionary situations today in other countries, someone has to be there to interpret for the hearers so they will understand what's being said. To just babble in a language people do not understand and expect them to somehow get something from it is the height of lunacy. 
<laughs> you so you'll sometimes see people, whether it's in movies or some other kind of situation, where that they are obviously trying to get something across to the person who speaks another language, and the idea is, well, if I will just slow down, maybe you'll understand what I'm saying. It doesn't work that way, friends. An unintelligible word is an unintelligible word, whether you speak it slowly or rapidly. And in every one of these cases, here's the key. Paul is saying somebody needs to know what's being said. How are you going to edify the church unless you understand the language? Well, we're going to stop right there and then get up further into this passage tomorrow and hopefully understand what Paul is trying to say when it comes to these spiritual gifts, especially some that were very prevalent in the early church in these days and how to use them. Because even if it's not something that you're practicing in your church and in your life right now, the principles we're going to be learning will be important when it comes to the proper exercise of all the spiritual gifts that are available today. So join us tomorrow. Difficult subject. I know for some of you, for some of us, but we're going to delve right into it and see what the word says. In the meantime, you have a great day in the Lord and keep lifting up Jesus. Keep pointing people to him in all these troubling times. And I'll see you right here tomorrow.